Appamata and its programs are supported by your generosity and your generosity and support makes such a difference. You can find a link for contributions on the website at appamata.org. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's kind of windy and warm here in Austin. It's nice. Hasn't gotten up to 100 degrees yet today, so <laughs> I can still say it's nice outside. Um, so I'm Ann Lipscomb. I'm one of the um, people that's been sitting here for a while. Um, and this morning, my um, my Dharma talk is actually a reading from a Dharma talk that was given by um, Ed Brown some years ago. And um, so you'll pardon me for not writing something on my own, but reading somebody else's stuff. But I wanted to start with a poem that I read recently that really spoke to me about the particular topic that, that this Dharma talk is about, which is about enjoyment in our life and in our practice. And um, so I'll start with this. In the name of the poem is, in the chemo room, I wear mittens of ice so I don't lose my fingernails, but I took a risk today to write this down. Whenever I spend the day crying, my friends tell me I look high. Good grief, they finally understand me. Even when the arena is empty, I thank God for the shots I miss. If you ever catch me only thanking God for the shots I make, remind me I'm not thanking God. Remind me all my prayers were answered the moment I started praying for what I already have. Jenny says when people ask if she's out of the woods, she tells them she'll never be out of the woods, says there is something lovely about the woods. I know how to build a survival shelter from fallen trees and branches, packed mud and pulled moss. I could survive forever on death alone. Wasn't it death that taught me to stop measuring my lifespan by length, but by width? Did you know how many beautiful things can be seen in a single second? Can you blow up a second like a balloon and fit infinity inside it? I'm infinite, I know, but I still have a measly wrinkle collection compared to my end goal. I would love to be a before picture, I think, as I look in the mirror and mistake my head for the moon. My dark thoughts are almost always 238,856 miles away from believing them. I love this life, I whisper into my doctor's stethoscope so she can hear my heart. My heart, an heirloom I didn't inherit until I thought I could die. Why did I go on believing so long I owed the world my disappointment? Why did I want to take the world by storm when I could have taken it by sunshine, by rose water? by the cactus flowers on the side of the road where I broke down. I'm not about to waste more time spinning stories about how much time I'm owed. But there is a man who is usually here who isn't today. I don't know if he's still alive. I just know his wife was made of so much hope. She looked like a firework above his chair. Will the afterlife be harder if I remember the people I love or forget them? Either way, please let me remember. So, let's see. There are so many wonderful talks 
in this book. The book is, you can't see it, but I'll read the title. The book is the most important point, Zen teachings of Ed, S, Edward S. B. Brown. And, uh, but the, so it was hard for me to choose which one to read. And now I'm having a hard time finding it, but I will find it. <laughs> well, maybe not. I will tell you that it's called The Secret of Life, which sort of thought I thought. Oh, good, good, at last, finally. Okay, here we go. The secret to life. I'm finally ready to tell you the secret of life. Of course, it's not really a secret. It's just that we hide this piece of information from ourselves and go on as though it were a secret. The secret to life is enjoyment. Some of you might get this right away. Of course, enjoyment. But most of you will ask, enjoyment? The concept is a bit scary. When I mention it to people, please enjoy your food. They may say, if I enjoyed my food, I'd be a blimp. So let's examine what enjoyment is and what it isn't. When does enjoyment turn into lust and greed? If you've become a blimp by enjoyment, then your devotion to enjoyment has not been serious enough. Your practice of enjoyment has slipped. We also have the notion that if we had enjoyment, we would fall in love rather easily and have unwanted pregnancies and all kinds of catastrophes. <laughs> I feel like I have to talk about this to reassure you that the practice of enjoyment could actually benefit you and allow you to go forward. Zen Master Dogen says that enjoyment is one of the Dharma gates. Enjoyment is also one of the five factors of the concentrative absorption or samadhi. The final stage of absorption includes enjoyment. It's also one of the 37 wings of enlightenment. And in another list, it is one of the seven factors or limbs of enlightenment. So I'm not making this up. Enjoyment is when we have a feeling of connecting with the object of our awareness and we allow it to move us. Your awareness or consciousness resonates with the object of awareness, resonates, vibrates, hums with, attunes to. In Aikido, they call it blending with. You blend your energy. When your consciousness connects with the object of awareness and resonates and blends, you are moved by and can move the object of awareness. You're that connected. There's enjoyment that is naturally enjoyment. Something happens and you enjoy it. And then there are times when you can cultivate enjoyment. Knowing that we can cultivate enjoyment is important because one of the ways Buddhism says we suffer is that we think our enjoyment depends on the object of consciousness. When we believe that enjoyment depends on the object, we feel the need to control our surroundings in order to experience joy. We have to get the right object, the one that is going to elicit the enjoyment in us. If I had the chocolate cake, I could have the enjoyment until I'm too full to have enjoyment from the chocolate cake then I would have more enjoyment from not eating the chocolate cake than I would from having continued to eat the cake. 
When you observe your experience, your level of enjoyment, carefully, you make wiser decisions. This is practice. This is subtle feeling reveals illumination. And he's referring there to a quote from a koan. We think, I need this object. We think, if somebody smiles at me, I could have enjoyment. If somebody frowns or is angry or upset or scared or sad or disappointed, I won't have enjoyment. I need them not to do those things. And I need them to do the other things that give me enjoyment. If others would behave the way I want them to behave, then I could have my enjoyment. So would you stop that? <laughs> because we believe our enjoyment is dependent on the object, we try to control the object. Shut up, go over there, come over here. We try to get things that would be enjoyable to be here and to get the things that wouldn't be enjoyable over there, somewhere else. How well does this work? Buddhism teaches it doesn't work very well, now does it? The things you enjoy often show up right in your face. The things you enjoy, the things you don't enjoy often show up right in your face. The things you enjoy are somehow over there. It's exactly the opposite of what you were thinking. And you keep thinking that if you just had a better way to control all these things, but that doesn't work either. It's very frustrating to become a Buddhist and still have the idea of controlling and manipulating objects, people, things, the weather, your body, your breath, sensations, thoughts, feelings. Trying to control these objects of awareness is called suffering because it cannot be done. Instead, you could practice enjoying whatever happens to show up. Is that simple or what? But how do you enjoy pain? How do you enjoy sickness? How do you enjoy fatigue? How do you enjoy anger? These things are not enjoyable. You're telling me to enjoy them? That's crazy. But the concept of enjoyment in Buddhism is that your awareness could actually connect with the object, whether it is work or play, a joy or a sorrow. Your consciousness could receive and connect with that object and resonate, even with frustration, sadness, disappointment, fatigue, and certainly with energy, joy, and delight. This is also called compassion. Sometimes it is called acceptance. It could be called forgiveness. It could be called gratitude. Here, we are calling it enjoyment. This is different from our usual idea of how to have happiness. Our usual idea is to touch things we are comfortable touching and not to have to touch or be touched by those other things that are so disgusting. Consequently, we spend a good deal of our lives being out of touch, literally out of touch with sensations, with feelings, with thoughts, with people in our lives, with the world around us. As soon as we are touched, one of those bad things might happen. One of those things that is unpleasant or painful or disgusting. So our default habit may be not touching. For many years now, Thich Nhat Hanh taught, please enjoy your breath. When we had a retreat with him at Green Gulch Farm in the early 80s, he told us that to practice enjoyment, we need to focus, pay attention, Concentrate, give our awareness to the object. You attune your awareness with the object of awareness. In this case, your breath. You allow your breath to inform you as it pleases, rather than telling your breath how to breathe better. That is, in a way that would be more preferable to you. You allow your body to be moved by your breath. 
there arises a level of enjoyment that is pure sensation. You are allowing the sensations of your breathing, of your being to arise and disappear with enjoyment resonating. When you're interested in connection and connecting with yourself, your own being, with another, with the world, with realization, then you allow yourself to be touched by sensation and to touch with your awareness. We have the idea that the mind is strong and the body is weak. Actually, it's the other way around. The body is strong. The mind is the weak one. Though neither arises without the other, we often fail to realize how faithful the body is and how willing. willing. We like to think that the mind is in charge, but who knows better how to breathe? You, the mind, or the breath, the body. In the summer of 1967, Brother David Stendhal Rast, the Benedictine monk, came to Tassajar for the very first practice period. I was the head cook. Brother David was the head dishwasher. So I would thank Brother David often. He was a true bodhisattva. No matter how hard he worked, people just kept bringing him more dirty dishes. It was never done. He cleaned things and people brought them back dirty. They didn't say, thank you for cleaning it. Now we'll take care of it. We'll venerate it. We'll honor it. We'll put it on the altar. No, they simply kept making things dirty again. So I would thank Brother David, the great Bodhisattva of Tassajara. Brother David once said that everything in life is a gift from God. This is a Christian way of putting it. But for it to be a gift from God, you have to receive it as though it were a gift from God. If you say, no, I don't want this gift. I don't see this experience as a gift. That's called sin. Sin is when you do not sense that the moment is a gift from God and you don't appreciate it. So your desire is a gift from God. When we get desire in life, wanting to eat or to have a relationship, often the first thing we want is to do is to get rid of it. Where is the gift of desire and connecting with desire and being moved by having desire? Enjoyment is not an easy practice, but it's where connection is. It's where intimacy is. It's where our real vitality and our real joy and energy reside. So thank you for listening. Um, and I, I'm torn between just talking. There's not a large group this morning. So um, just being able to talk all together versus uh, going to breakout rooms, and I think it's a small enough group that we won't do breakout rooms um, and just try to feel that we are in intimate connection with each other now without having a smaller group. So I'm very interested in people's thoughts and what this brought up for them the ideas they had listening or thinking about this talk by Ed Brown. Yeah, Lori. I love this talk. <clears throat> um, yeah, I just love this talk because I know generally we do exactly what he's talking about. We separate, we don't want. And so we make ourselves miserable, miserable so often because it's just not going the way we wanted. We wanted X mm -hmm. and Y is here, and I didn't really want Y. And um, I think it's a wonderful practice that when Y comes up, is 
becoming intimate with it. Mm. I mean, it is a really a big challenge, but it's also energizing, I think. And uh, so, yeah, I just really appreciate it. I'm oh, good. I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, his work, Ed's teaching is very, um, I don't really know, uh, the best word that comes to me is very sweet. It's very gentle in a way um, that I really appreciate. So. Um, can you please repeat the title of the book? Yeah. Here I can, no, that won't work. It's called The Most Important Point, Zen Teachings of Edward S. Bay Brown. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we have Nelda. Good morning. Good morning, Anne. Good morning, everyone. And I may have misheard something as you were reading, but the way my mind processes, processed it was connecting enjoyment and desire. Could you speak more to that from, from what was read in the book? Because it almost seemed to equate them and I don't equate them. No, I don't believe that's what he was saying. I'm not sure what you're, you know, which part you're referring to. I mean, he, there's another Dharma talk at a different space in the book about differentiating between um, enjoyment and desire, lust, and greed. Um, but I think, I think what he's saying is that desire arises and that it can be an object of enjoyment. Desire is our vitality, our energy, and it's a gift from God is what he was saying. That makes sense. And how do we meet it? Do we meet it as, oh my gosh, this is bad. If I go, if I, if I feel this, this is wrong. If I feel this and become intimate with this and learn what happens in my body, what happens in my mind, and how do I resonate with this object of mind that that is enjoyment um, that a lot of times I think for me um, I think in my practice of Zen and generally in my um, my being part of this culture in this particular time, I think desire is really um, pushed away. What he's talking about is not touched because of fear of something bad happening. This is coming up, but this is not what I want. This is, I want something else, like Lori was saying, and I'm going to turn away from this. And I think he's saying in turning away from that, we're we're turning away from a great practice, a great teaching. So that would be my, my thought about that. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I add something to that? It's, yeah. it's my understanding too, it's not about acting on whatever the feeling is. It's, right. it's about being totally, uh, totally needing it, totally needing the feeling. But the action is not what you're focusing on. It's, right. It's, it's what's coming up and meeting that. What a big practice that is. Rather than shutting it down because it's inconvenient or whatever. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Kim. Well, two questions. One is, I think the title is from Suzuki Roshi, but I don't remember what the most important point somewhere oh, in yeah. it, he says it over and over but what is the most important what does he say it is different things at different times oh, okay. <laughs> well, 
Well, that doesn't Many, help. many most important okay. points. And the, the second is just kind of the quandary I'm in of, so certainly we want enjoyment. So mm. what exactly do we do to get it? I think his prescription is to, as he describes, connect with the object of awareness, to let letting our mind go and abiding things and letting things return and abide in the mind all throughout the day and night, as Dogen says. And how does that, I'm being tough here, how does that create enjoyment? Where, where, do, you, where do you think it comes from? I think there's, itself? I think it's a visceral sensation of being completely present and being completely connected. Somehow that connected. feels good. You get touched. You're being touched constantly by what it is. Yeah. And you're very here. You're not someplace else. You're not wishing for something else. Um, thinking this is not quite right. The, I know I was talking to um, Todd sort of about this topic and he was telling me a story about breaking down in an old truck and um, he knew there was no way he could fix it and he was in a neighborhood and he just pulled off to the side of the road in front of a house and he called he had to call the tow truck and it was going to be like two hours before the tow truck got there and he thought about okay I can make a choice here I can sit here and fret for two hours and be angry and wish it was another way and think about all I have to be doing and how this is keeping me from doing it. Or I can realize the sun is out. It's not raining. And I am in a position where I can't do any of the duties or things that I'm called to do. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy this day. And he said it was one of the most wonderful two hours of his life. <laughs> um, so I think one of the one of the pitfalls about thinking about how do we get to enjoyment or what causes enjoyment is that we think about it as a, a happy feeling. That's how we use it. And I think he's talking about it in a different way. He's talking about it, like he says at one point, we could call this gratitude. We could call this acceptance. And here we're saying it's enjoyment. Not enough. Hi, thank you for this rich and nourishing exploration. Um, I'm wondering uh, if I could see a show of hands of how many people know what the five languages of love are. Okay, so there's this man named Gary Chapman who wrote a book called The Five Languages of Love. And I was just reminded of it by part of what you just said. So his, um, his, 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 he presents five languages of love, which are physical affection, uh, communicating love in written or spoken words, spending time together, giving gifts or acts of service. And mm -hmm. everybody is more fluent in some of these languages than in others. And everybody has a preference in terms of how they want to receive love. They don't, and so two people can be in a relationship and they're both giving all of their love to the other person, but it's not being perceived, let alone received, because one person is giving acts of service to somebody who wants uh, spoken love, and another person is giving gifts to somebody who wants to spend time together. Uh -huh. So it's it's like you have this you have this desire 
for a blue box and someone gives you an orange, uh, an orange circle. Um, and if you don't recognize the orange circle as love, you don't even know that you're being loved. Mm -hmm. And this is reminding me of, you know, the gift from God is, you know, we could say that's an in, in, in invocation to love, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And it may not come in the form that we were hoping for or that we know how to recognize. But if we can open ourselves to recognizing, as Todd did in that example, that this was a gift from God, as one way to say that, rather mm -hmm. than a terrible, a terrible, you know, disastrous mistake then our experience is entirely different. I will say though that um, I'm, I struggle a little bit with the word enjoyment and I mm -hmm. feel like I'm resonating with Kim in this because it contains the word joy. And I think what, from what I understood, I would call what he's talking about surrender not surrender as in you win, I lose, but surrender as in I, I give myself wholly to every moment um, without withholding and without judging. And, you know, I, I, I have several chronic illnesses, so I do experience fatigue and pain and, um, and anger and, and illness, you know, all those things he mentioned every day and for most of the day. Um, and often I can't even get out of bed. So I'm lying there and what do I do with that? Mm. And um, I don't think that I can turn those experiences into experiences of joy, but I do think there's a way to surrender to them so that I'm not basically shooting the second arrow. I'm not causing extra suffering by resisting my reality. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's so wise that, yeah, we want things to be one way and unless they're that way, we don't want to go there. We don't think that experience is one we want and if we don't want it, we're not going to experience it. And so we spend a lot of time, like he was saying, be out of touch with what's actually happening. Yeah. So thank you, Janelle. Thank you. So if there aren't any other thoughts or ideas, I think we'll move on to the last part of our service. So thank you very much. <laughs>